Welcome, Matt McCampers. Good morning. Good morning, Matt McCampers. Yes. Are you ready to have fun today? Great, because that is my primary goal, is for us to have a good time. Awesome. And we're going to start with a game. It's like Simon Says, except I'm Mark, so this is Mark Says. OK, and so you know how it works. I'm going to say what to do, and then you guys do it. Are you ready? OK, everyone, well, stand up. OK, up, 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 come on. Mark Says, up. OK, this is a different, this is different. Good one. OK, ready? Here we go. Hands on your head. OK, Mark says, hands on your head. <laughs> Mark says, hands on your heart. OK, Mark says, one on your heart, one on your head. And then Mark says, two hands up. That's pretty good. Let's go try that again. Hey, okay, Mark says, hands on your head. Mark says, hands on your heart. One in your heart, one in your head. Ha ha. <laughs> Mark says, one on your heart, one in your head. Mark says, two heads up. OK, so here we go. I got a question for you. Creating and mobilizing advocates, is it more science or is it more art? OK, if you think that it's mostly science and metrics and, and the processes and data and all that, OK, that's science. If you think it's more about the, the way you make people feel and the wording and the softness of it, that's art. And, and if you think it's a bit of art, a bit of science, then you're going to do this, one on your heart, one on your head. And if you just don't care and think this is goofy, you're going to do two hands up. OK, ready? <laughs> ready, here we go. Science, art, go. Oh, wow, this is a good diversity. A lot of both a mix of art and science here. And I agree, it's both of that. Thank you so much. Please sit down. Much appreciated. Great. Now, I know a little bit about art. Because when I was uh, in college, I had a little business around, around painting. Not like the Monet or the like Picasso kind of painting. More like uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. And red and blue and royal purple and flowing fuchsia, you see? It was a house painting business. I was 20 years old, um, and I had a little business called Organized Painting Services. To sound all official, right? Organized Painting Services. Um, and I mean, that's really where I first learned about the power of advocacy. Because the way that I were to get clients in those days was to knock in the pouring rain and have people take pity on me. Um, and that was a really hard way to get customers. And I quickly learned it was way more effective to get referrals and testimonials in order to build a business. So that was my introduction. The other thing that uh, I learned was it was really good to have like hunky shirtless dudes uh, painting houses because that really got the word of mouth going with the housewives. <laughs> They get it any way you can. Uh, I didn't have, to, luckily, did not have to do the painting and save people from that. I learned very quickly I was more built for selling than shirtless painting. But anyway, uh, this was not destined to become a raging success that will allow me to retire by the age of 20. So um, I uh, wanted something bigger and better. So a lot of things I could have done at the time, I mean, I could have. I've gone to business school and uh, maybe take some business courses or, or get a mentor in entrepreneurship or uh, go raise some money or something like that. But instead, I went to go and study neuroscience. Huh? Why did I go do that? Um, well, as, as interesting as small scale entrepreneurship was at the time, uh, I was even more fascinated by this idea of complex systems, the idea that if you get enough um, simple things together in the right kind of pattern, you get like emergent behavior. And it's a lot, I mean, the brain is like the ultimate manifestation of that, right? You get a number of these relatively simple neural cells together, these neurons together, and you get this explosion of intelligence. 
right? So fascinating. And I had a really interesting experience as an undergraduate that got me so fired up about this. And it's all related, um, okay, I missed the story here. Oh, why not? Let's go tell that story. I think it's interesting. Um, there's another reason why I went into this, and that is because of my parents. Okay, so uh, growing up Jewish, there's two things, there's two things that every Jewish parent wants for their kid. Number one, marry someone else who's Jewish. And number two, go be a doctor. <laughs> so by going into uh, a PhD program in neurosciences, I wait for my parents to say, look, there's my son, Maki, the doctor, right? Um, anyway, so I figured out I went into it. Um, this is first what got me kind of fired up uh, to get into neuroscience. Does anybody know what this is? Look, looks like a grasshopper, right? Um, it's a special kind of grasshopper, actually. It's a locust. Now, locusts are relatively simple creatures. Um, they have especially really simple brains, just a small handful of neurons. But when you get enough of them together in the right conditions, and when the right individuals touch one another, you get this, a swarm. That's crazy. Has anybody seen a locust swarm before? That's great. Why just now? Alright. How did that make you feel? <laughs> my my mother, um, when she was a little girl, saw a locust swarm. Uh, growing up in the Middle East and said it was absolutely the most terrifying thing she'd ever seen in her life. Um, but the professor I was working with was really intrigued to understand under what conditions do locusts swarm? Why and how do they swarm? And particularly interesting is that even in a cloud of billions of locusts, they never touch each other in flight. How is that possible with such a simple brain? So I was sent on the task to try to figure this out. And to start with, we started with a model. This is a modern model of the locust flight system. As you can see, there is not a lot of neurons there, just a handful of neurons that excite and inhibit. Um, and the version of the model that I was given uh, back in 1994 um, had one big problem in it. Didn't work. <laughs> Didn't actually model the behavior that we saw in the bug itself. Right? So my job is to try to figure out what's going on. And through a lot of trial and error, which is really all I did, just a bunch of trying this neuron, that neuron, let's see what happens to me. We actually found that there was one really big source of negative pressure, of inhibitory pressure, that made the whole flight system work. So great. Professor was really excited and he's like, awesome. He didn't actually say awesome. He said, very good. Anyway, he said, um, now you actually have to go and find it in the bug itself. And that meant that I had to go and get some locusts. And that meant I had to go into the locust room, which is about the most vile place that you can imagine, OK? Imagine a room in the sub-basement filled with hundreds of thousands of stinky bugs, OK? releasing clouds of locust exoskeleton into the air. You cannot imagine a more disgusting place. And what I had to do was go into these glass, plexiglass cages and reach in to the cage with all these bugs that are kind of wriggling all over you. And they spew out this black goo, which is the locust defense mechanism against research scientists. <laughs> and I, I couldn't do it. I mean, it was just so gross. Um, and, you know, the worst thing is, it, in the corner of the room, there was this actually quite a pretty girl, and she was laughing at me. <laughs> it was terrible. So I saw a fly swatter in the corner. I said, you know what, let me try this. I grabbed the fly swatter to go try to pick up a bug and to try to, you know, snatch it, because I just couldn't reach in there with all those wriggling things. Um, and wouldn't you know it, the bug starts like hopping around all over the floor, and then me and the pretty girl are there trying to go and pick it up. 
Um, and finally, she, and I'm eternally grateful for this, she picks up the bug for me and shows me how to go and do it. Long story short, um, the professor did end up finding this magical mystery neuron, and the mechanism by which locusts can fly without touching each other has actually been solved. Now, you may be wondering something. Why am I telling you all this stuff? What does this have to do with AdvoCamp? Well, this is camp. <laughs> and if there's one thing I associate with camp, it's bugs. But what would camp be without a good bug story, right? All right, all right. No, there is actually a point to the story, right? And that is that, like locusts, we humans can swarm. All right, there we go. We humans swarm under the right conditions and when touched by the right individuals, we form a collective, very much like the, intelli the super intelligent locust collective when you get them together in a group. We swarm to stadiums to watch our favorite team. We swarm to concerts to go see our favorite band. We swarm towards products and brands that we adore. And there's one really critical thing required in order to make the swarm happen. There are these special individuals that because of their connections and their authority and their authentic enthusiasm, they compel everyone else to join the swarm. And so I've realized, and the reason why I wanted to do this conference is that for me, I've learned that advocacy is the goal. Isn't this what we all want? Swarms of customers to come to us, right? To go and try and use our products. But if that's what we want, we want swarms of customers, then we should focus on the advocates first. If we get them, right, then they will compel and they will bring, right, all those customers to us. If you are looking for more revenue and profit and cash flow and growth in your business, focus on the advocates first. If you're looking for personal growth and, and learning and development in your life, build advocates for yourself. That's the goal. I'm not the only entrepreneur to figure this out. Um, I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs throughout history who have understood that delighting the customer and then mobilizing them is a great business strategy. Um, and so we have some other entrepreneurs that are here. Uh, we have Rob Meinhart, who's a, a great friend and the founder of Case, sold that to Dell. It is now the fastest growing, best performing division of Dell. Okay, he's always said, I don't want any marketing happening in here without a happy customer attached to it. Hey, we have Nick Mehta, who similarly, CEO of Live Office, sold that successfully to Symantec and is now innovating in the area of how to create new advocates in the first place, right? In his company, Gainsight, which is really innovating in customer success automation. We have Adam Kleinberg, from the Traction Company, an agency which has won more agency of the year awards than I can ever remember seeing, right? How does he do it, right? He does it by putting the advocate at the center of his agency and helping all of his clients do the same thing. And we have more than just great entrepreneurs that are here. We also have amazing practitioners. You know, you guys who actually do the work, right? And you guys who are actually doing all the innovating are here to go and share your knowledge with everyone else. And we have a community for all of you people who are excited about this idea, and that community is called AdvoCamp. So AdvoCamp. The first thing you know about AdvoCamp, it's important, is it's a camp, right? It's not an ordinary conference, right? So as Jim said, relax. Have fun, enjoy it, right? Don't take yourself too seriously. That's the number one rule of AdvoCamp. Don't take yourself too seriously. Have a good time. Um, let this be your laboratory. This is your place to share all of those techniques that you are learning every day. Please share it with one another, because we're innovating in this area. This is the only camp of its kind. Um, so you know, strongly encourage you to do that. Are you curious to know who else is here? Who else is around you? I am. I think it's time for roll call. Roll call, Kipper, Adam. Awesome. Way to go. 
All right, let's start, let's start with geography. Who do we have here from uh, the non-Californian 49 states? Awesome. OK, who do we have here from Canada? Yeah! OK, non-influvians from Canada. Awesome. Hey, that's pretty good. That's awesome. Who, and who do we have here from the rest of the world? Europe, Asia, South America. That's awesome. That's a big contingent. And how about California? That's a lot of people. Way to go. Not too far, but you know what? There's like 12 other conferences happening at the same time. So we really appreciate you coming here. That's great. How about functional areas? Do we have anyone here from customer success? Yeah. OK, how about customer experience, user experience? Yeah, we got lots of you guys. Awesome. <laughs> Product managers. OK, not to me. All right, next year, we're going to get more product managers. That's really important, OK? If you want to get advocates, you got to delight them with your product, right? OK, bring your product managers next year. Uh, marketers, probably have a lot of marketers. Yeah, demand gen, social community marketing, customer marketing. Have any lawyers? <laughs> the original advocates, the lawyers. <laughs> Awesome. I mean, and this is what makes this so much fun for me. I mean, it reminds me a lot of the neuro conferences I used to go to. People from all different walks of life sharing their newest techniques together, making all that innovation. So let us be your laboratory today, and, and please share all that info. And uh, I'd like to do, give a little bit of thanks. Again, thank you, sponsors, to make this happen. Please do investigate the innovation in their booths. Uh, we are also a sponsor at Influitive. And we have an announcement. We have a fabulous new product that we are releasing to the world today. You're going to be some of the first people to see it. Okay, it's our new community module. If you've ever yearned for an engaging community experience for your company, right, that uh, works a lot more like you know, Stack Overflow or Quora uh, and has advocacy all interwoven in it, a really engaging community experience, well, yearn no more. We have it here. Please do come and check it out in our booth. I uh, also like to thank the Advocate team. Way to go. I think you guys knocked it out of the park. Awesome. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you here, innovators, provocateurs, just plain curious people that are here. Thank you so much for coming. If Advocamps are a raging success, which I expect it will be, it's all your fault. <laughs> awesome. Now, if Advocamp was like the uh, academy of witchcraft and wizardry, our esteemed Headmaster Dumbledore would be the great Fred Reicheld. <laughs> awesome. Now, I first encountered Fred when I started at my first and only respectable job uh, as a management consultant at Bain and Company back in 1998. And, and when we started uh, there, the first thing that we were given, one of the first things, was the book. Do you guys know what the book is? It is The Loyalty Effect. The Loyalty Effect back in 1998. And it was a complete revolution in business. In fact, I think formed the bedrock of the entire SaaS and customer, and, um, customer success community today. Um, I mean, how many of you here know how much more it costs to retain, sorry, to, to win a new customer than to retain a customer? A right, show of like numbers. Or speak it out. What's the number? Six and seven. Everyone knows it. Everybody. Six or seven times as much. Right? The whole customer success industry is sort of built on that. Um, so it's awesome to have Fred here. You know, when I was interviewing at Bain, they asked me the question that probably a lot of you have heard like maybe a hundred times. Um, what, what would you like to be doing in five years? Hmm. And so my answer was, not working here. <laughs> they hired me anyway. Because <laughs> I wanted to get back into business. I thought Maine would be a great place to learn how to be a, a better, better businessman. I can't believe they hired me anyway. Um, and 20 months later, I was out of there. <laughs> uh, and I had started my uh, new company called Eloqua, which actually ended up doing pretty well. Um, and when it was time to put the goal into my business, right? I wanted to build advocacy into the business. Who else did I turn to? Then back to Fred Reicheld, 
who created an amazing sequel to loyalty effect around the net promoter score, which many of you use. Um, and that is what we used in 2003, really early, probably one of the first software companies to implement it. Uh, it's because I saw it in the monograph before you made it available. Anyone else is an alumni. Um, so I was able to implement it really, really early, and it was instrumental in our rapid growth um, at, at, at Eloqua. But I yearned to do more than just ask people how likely they were to refer us. I wanted to track what they actually did, not what they promised to do. Okay, and um, I wanted to drive that too, right? I wanted to track it, I wanted to drive it, and I would have that opportunity when I founded Influitive in 2010. Now, Influitive is built on two big ideas. The first, we already talked about, okay? Advocacy is really important for driving fundamental business results. Okay, we already talked about that. But the second thing is, if you want to drive this kind of advocate activity that we all want, right? Those references, referrals, case studies, testimonials, videos, social buzz, the way to do that is to focus on the advocate experience first. The advocate experience. If you make the experience amazing for those people, they will reciprocate by doing a lot more of that activity that we all want for our businesses. Advocates want to feel like they're part of the team. They want that sense of identity, right, that's bigger than themselves. They want to understand the impact that they're making on your business. They want social capital. They want recognition. They want the kind of engaging and, dare I say, addictive experience that you're going to hear from Nir Eyal, our second keynoter today, who I think wrote one of the most important books of the last few years, most important business books, Hooked. So really excited about that. So we've talked a little bit about the past. The past, the loyalty effect, that promoter score. On the marketing side, we've still sent out a lot of emails. We've been bombarded with a lot of ads, <laughs> right? We're moving past that now. We're in the present. The sequel, call it the locust effect, okay? We are learning how to harness the power of the swarm. All of you here in this room, we are learning how to harness the power of the swarm to drive our business to the next level. What about the future? Okay, I'm asked a lot about the future, and frankly, I don't know a lot about what's gonna happen in the future, but here's what I feel confident about. We're gonna see a lot more advocacy as a core part of our businesses going forward. I see a day when most businesses have some form of a program to go and mobilize advocates, where most companies are attuned to this, the need to create raving fans for themselves. And frankly, that is a world that I'm excited about living in, right? That's a world of uh, visionary and, and quality and engaging products. That's a world of service that knows my needs before I express it or even before I know it. That's a world of companies that I'd want to work at because it's a great experience working there. Those are companies I want to invest in because I know that they're going to make a lot of money. Now, I've got a story for you that has the past, the present, and the future all rolled into one. Remember when I told you that story about the locust room? And there was a pretty girl in the corner that was laughing at me? Well, I asked her out. Because, <laughs> I mean, nothing says romance like hundreds of thousands of bugs. <laughs> uh, and, and she said, no. <laughs> but I was persistent. And in time, I married her. And we're still married. <laughs> um, we got married in this pink fairy tale castle in Scotland. And the centerpieces had these uh, replica grasshoppers. So to most of you, a locust might be something to feel some revulsion about. For me, it's a beautiful creature. It's capable of collective intelligence. It's driven my career. And it's given me the love of my life. And together, we created these adorable critters. <laughs> uh, these are my children. Um, this is my, uh, my son, Solomon, who's uh, almost five, and my, my daughter, uh, Skye, who's eight and a half. Um, and 
and I hope I do right by them. I hope that they, um, they become my greatest advocate. I mean, look, look, most people can become parents. Not everybody, not everyone can become a great parent. And lesser still are people who do such an amazing job of parenting that their kids are their biggest fans. So I'll leave you with this thought. Who is your greatest advocate? Are you creating the wow moments in the lives of your family, of your coworkers, to make them raving fans, advocates for you? Because this is the central organizing principle of my life now, is to create, um, to create raving fans for, for me, for my ideas, for, for my company. OK, fun time. <laughs> All right, we're going to play Simon Says again. Oh, sorry, Mark Says. Mark Says, stand up. Here we go. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba, stand up. All right, everyone stretch. Stretch really far. Oh, that feels good, doesn't it? Awesome. Ah, that's what I want you to do, today, to do today. I want you to stretch really far. I want you to really open your mind to new ideas. Okay? I want you to really get out of your comfort zone to truly meet one another. Okay, go look around and find someone you know. Okay, go go and look and find someone that you don't know. That's easier, huh? What do you see? What do you see? I see leaders, okay? I see the future artists and scientists of the, of the advocate revolution. I see, I see the future advocates for you. Thank you, advocampers. Long live the swarm. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Mm.